Okay, good morning. It's uh, 10 o'clock in uh, Copenhagen and a warm welcome to this session on the EU's Stability and Growth Pact. In Denmark, we are often latecomers to big European debates. We often mobilize when uh, decisions are just about to be reached. So the goal of this webinar series that we call European Flash is to remedy that by organizing sessions well ahead before a dossier hits sort of the uh, end game. And well, this time we have really, really decided to kickstart a debate early. So I guess you can say that this is an early, early, early bird debate that you will now uh, participate in because decisions on a reform, stability and growth pact are anything but around the corner. First, we need to have a new German chancellor in office, and then we also have to have presidential elections in France. And well, just as importantly, we need to agree upon what is actually the problem that has to be solved if you want to reform the stability pact. But that being said, there's obviously already lots of debate taking place. For instance, suggestions by the European Fiscal Board, advisory body to the European Commission, headed by Professor Nils Thuesen of the University of Copenhagen, who sends his regards. He's chairing a meeting in the board as we speak. And before the summer break, the EU Commissioner Gentilini reminded everyone, I quote, it is clear we cannot simply go back to normal, quote unquote, once the present suspension of the pact agreed upon during the COVID comes to an end. And just yesterday, Politico reported that seven countries, including Denmark, have signed an Austrian letter in the run-up to today's meeting in the Eurogroup, which is interpreted as an attempt to draw red lines in this overall debate. So some of the key questions that we want to discuss with our panel here today and with you in this early, early bird session are, if we are not going back to normal, where should we go and why, in other words, what is the problem that has to be fixed if there is one? Secondly, how will the German and French election play into all this? And thirdly, how could the discussion eventually impact Denmark? And how could Denmark try to play its cards also after it was signed the Austrian letter? I have assembled my own uh, dream team and I'll introduce them as we go along. And thank you very much to all of you for agreeing when I wrote to you before the summer break. I'm really grateful about that. And we'll start by going to Germany, to Berlin, to a scholar I always turn to when I'm a bit confused what is happening in Germany with economic policy, what does Karlsruhe actually mean in its new verdict, the Constitutional Court. So we go to Lukas Gutenberg, Deputy Director of Jacques Delors Center in Berlin. So what is the German debate? How is that developing on the Stability and Growth Pact? And has it already hit the German election? Over to you, Lukas. Uh, yeah, thanks a lot, Lika, uh, for for the invitation and for putting putting together this panel. Um, I'd like to, to make three points: one on like the general context, one on on the rules specifically, and then uh, one on on Germany, um, because I think what I say on Germany makes a lot more sense with the, the, these other things in mind. So I think one one thing when we discuss the the fiscal rules is that we have to to remind ourselves constantly that. Um, these rules embody a fiscal policy consensus that was formed right after the euro crisis or the, or the financial crisis, so in the early 2010s. Um, and this, it, this consensus is now embodied in national, rule, national fiscal rules and the European fiscal rules. Um, this consensus was very much tilted towards fiscal sustainability, which was an understandable, albeit I would say wrong, reaction to the, to the euro crisis, but this is where, where the consensus stands. And I would say there are three uh, arguments why um, this old consensus uh, is outdated now. Um, as I said, I think already at the time, it was probably too rigid. And we saw that um, coming out of the, of the financial crisis and the Euro crisis, Europe hit like basically a second recession um, because um, to some extent at least, uh, there was premature fiscal tightening in a number of countries. Um, and, and I think this is a risk, a material risk we also have now coming out of the COVID crisis um, that we, we uh, put on the brakes too early. And I think the, 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 the prevailing consensus goes exactly in that direction. I think the second po point why this consensus is outdated is because we have um, put uh, the fight against climate change uh, at the forefront of the European agenda that will require massive investment. Um, and it's pretty clear that 
with a consensus that is so much tilted towards fiscal sustainability, the environmental side and the climate side of the equation um, just can't live up to the ambition we have formulated. And I would say there's a third argument, um, which is that when this consensus formed in 2010, 2011, we had a completely different architecture of the Eurozone. So we didn't have an ESM there permanently. We didn't have an ECB that um, in 2012 and then in the years that followed completely assumed its role of, as a, the central bank of the Eurozone um, and which also changed, uh, changed the overall equation to a point where I would say the prudent, prudency margins we needed um, in the early stages of the European crisis um, are probably not the same that we would need today. Um, so taking this together, I would say we need a new fiscal policy consensus, one that is still grounded in fiscal sustainability, but that leaves a lot more space for um, investment, especially when it comes to climate change, and that also ensures that we don't put the brakes on too early. So now if you look specifically at one of the expressions of this consensus, which are the EU fiscal rules, I think the picture gets a bit more complex. Um, so there's wild disagreement uh, in the EU about how binding these rules are. So if you ask people in Germany, they would usually say, and I think it's the same in Denmark, that it's like an unenforceable set of rules that basically has no effect. When you ask people in Portugal or in Italy, they will say it's a straight jacket that strangles the economy. So we have fundamentally no agreement on how these rules even work in practice today or before the crisis, which makes it really hard to discuss where you want to go next in terms of um, changing the rules. And I think that's the first thing we need to come to groups with. Um, I think everyone is unhappy with the, the rules as they stand. The Commission, because it's very hard to bend over backwards every time to, to accommodate the economic um, necessities. And I think a lot of countries on both sides of, 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 of the discussion, um, because no, uh, neither get what they, what they really want out of these rules. I think from an economic point of view, the, uh, as I just said, because the consensus behind these rules is really out of whack, also the rules are. Um, and if we put them in, um, back into action as they are on the books, like literally, then um, especially the debt rules or the, the obligation to reduce um, the, the debt to GDP ratio by 120th um, before you're coming to 60% every year would imply massive adjustments that does economically make no sense. So we need something um, after this. And I think there are two options now. One is that we get a new fiscal policy consensus and an agreement like how we want to want national fiscal policies to change after the crisis in the uh, uh, fashion I just described. And then we have a clear direction and the, then we can go to the plumbing of the rules and implement that. Or um, we do muddling through. We basically put the rules back in place with, I think, everybody agreeing that they can't be applied by book. And then the commission will be in a very tough spot of finding new flexibilities, new loopholes every time, and maybe not achieving it um, fully. This will, will, damage, will um, do damage economically, it will do damage to the, um, to the commission, it will uh, do damage to the credibility of the rules. And I think especially in northern countries um, who have a very close attachment to the rules should be very careful about not doing this further damage to the credibility of the framework. Um, what I think won't work is to now go to a reform of the rules on a technical level to say we just change a bit the mechanics of the rules because we don't like them as economists without a clear direction. I think that would just mean spending a lot of political capital without going anywhere and I think there's a good um, likelihood that we will end up exactly where we are now. Um, last point on Germany. I think so, so, so far, the election debate or campaign has not focused on Europe at all. That has changed a bit yesterday when the CDU started a pretty organized attack on Scholz, saying um, the SPD chancellor candidate um, that uh, he would uh, basically turn Europe in a into a transfer union, that he would flood Europe with German money. It was like the old populist playbook on you cannot trust the social democrats with our money and sending money to Europe is basically treason, um, which was very unfortunate because it was like not at all the tone of the campaign so far and also not the tone that CDU had adopted, especially after the recovery instrument um, last year. Um, but I think it's, uh, if you look at the polls, you know why, why they did that. 
Um, the rules per se, even there, didn't really appear. And um, the way debt and deficits are discussed are mostly in the domestic context. And I think that also makes sense, like from a European perspective, that Germany now has to come to grips with its own like contradictions on the fiscal side, because we also have rules that embody this old, old consensus, namely the debt break. And any new government will find out pretty quickly that if they want to adhere to the debt break um, next year or the years after, it will be very hard for them. And so um, they will have to come to a new direction of fiscal policy and to have to solutions to change or like that, that, that um, in some way will be a departure from the debt break. And I think that will also then give you an indication of the German position at the European level. Um, and so I think in a nutshell, it's good that we first have in Germany the domestic debate, and then we will from that extrapolate the position of, for the European debate. And then, um, then we will see what happens. I think because the polls are so volatile, it's so hard to, to really say anything about what a new government um, direction would look like on this. Um, but yeah, I think just because of the domestic situation, I would expect that there's some, some form of opening. And I think I stop here. Excellent. Thank you very much. And also for highlighting the fact that we should not just study, obviously, what the various parties say with regards to European policy, but in particular also what they say on the Schuldenbremse and so forth domestically. Uh, really, really important uh, point. We now move to uh, to Paris, uh, where we have uh, Sean Vallée. You are working in Berlin uh, at the at the German Council for Foreign Relations, heading the Geoeconomics program. Before that, you worked well many places, but uh, you worked worked for Emmanuel Macron when he was Minister of Economics, and I also remember that you worked as an advisor for Hermann van Rompuy, because you once tried to explain to me what the six pack was all about sort of when that was negotiated when I, when I worked as a parliamentarian in, in, in Denmark. So, so uh, you, did, uh, you did the trick then, I think. Uh, don't ask me sort of about the details about it now, but now I'm obviously interested, we all are. What is your take on this debate? And if you could sort of add a little bit of, sort of the French sort of uh, presidential election campaign that's just about to start, we would also be grateful for that. But over to you and thanks for doing this. Thank you for your uh, invitation. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here and it's much easier to speak uh, after Lucas because I think he has uh, set the stage perfectly well. I think I, I second everything he has uh, he has said. I would probably uh, just say a word about the rules in the broader context of the European economic governance because I, I think we tend to have a narrow discussion around the fiscal rules uh, often forgetting that actually they're part and parcel of a of a bigger uh, of a bigger agenda, and I think it's useful to have that in mind because it's quite possible that we will only be able to move on the fiscal rules if we have reached a consensus on the broader uh, European and Euro area architecture, and I say that in particular uh, with respect to the degree of European fiscal integration, where we have actually taken quite an important leap during the COVID crisis with the creation of the RRF. Uh, and there is a great uh, a question mark today about whether this leap during the COVID crisis was just an, ex an exceptional and temporary uh, a moment as it was uh, um, uh, designed to be, or whether this is actually the stepping stone of a much bigger uh, architectural uh, shift inside the Euro area that could lead, lead to a permanent uh, fiscal uh, instrument uh, at the EU level uh, that would enable greater stabilization, more transfers, and more allocative policies. So I think it's useful. I'm, I'm not going to go into the details of that debate because that's not the topic of today, but I think it's important to have that in the background as uh, as, as something that informs also the debate on, on, on the fiscal rules. Um, I completely agree with what uh, Lucas has said about uh, the difference between the intellectual consensus and, and, and the policy implementation. Um, I would probably add, and he said it in passing, but I probably uh, you know, strengthen that point, that I, you know, I think we should not underestimate the degree to which uh, the European fiscal consensus enshrined in the rules uh, is heavily influenced by the German consensus on that matter. And we tend to forget that, you know, there was a constitutional uh, 
uh, debt break introduced in Germany in 2009 and basically the TSCG in 2011, uh, which indeed is the result of the of the of the 2010-11 euro crisis, is also the result of the great influence that uh, the constitutional debt break in Germany had on the European debate. And that's why I, I thought and continue to think that uh, it is absolutely necessary to have a, an appeased conversation in Europe about uh, the future of the fiscal rules. Uh, it is absolutely necessary that this conversation has taken place before in Germany. And I'm a bit uh, uh, sorry that this election campaign hasn't been the occasion to discuss that as much as I thought. Uh, the Green Party has put that on the agenda and has made some proposals to reform the fiscal rules. In my view, it has made these proposals without owning them and making them an important political priority, such that they have not entered the political debate as much as I think they should have. And it's important to note that the other parties um, are basically more or less happy with the status quo, even though they each have different views about how the status quo can be uh, amended or circumvented. So I think before we have a European debate, uh, it will be critical to see how the coalition negotiations uh, discuss that topic. It might be, and that, you know, it, in my case, is the central scenario, that they discuss it but decide not to say anything very clear about it. And so we're left with the same uncertainty. So, you know, the best possible scenario, in my view, is that basically uh, the German coalition agreement, you know, is more or less open about it. So it does not, you know, stipulate a strict return to the rules or does not stipulate, you know, a return to the black zero, but instead as, as, a, as a more open uh, uh, language. Uh, and so that, I think, will greatly inform uh, what, what can take place in Europe. Uh, and, and now moving on to France, maybe, and, and how much uh, France and, and others can move that, that debate. Um, you've seen the recent interview of Paolo Gentiloni uh, about uh, fiscal rules, where he's basically, uh, for, you know, once more, uh, kind of shying from making an executive decision and putting out a proposal arguing that in the absence of a consensus, this would just be a wasted opportunity. And he probably he probably has a point. Now the question is, what does the commission do to create that consensus? And in the absence of a debate uh, steered by the commission, it's quite unlikely that we'll ever get to that consensus. But so basically, we're not going to have big action by, uh, by the commission in, in, in the short term. And the question is whether France, both as part of the presidency of the EU that it that it uh, takes over in January, as well as uh, part of its uh, election campaign that will basically take place at the same time, whether France decides to to do something about it. And if we had had this uh, uh, seminar a few months ago, I would have been fairly positive that France would have tried to put this on the agenda for two reasons. One, to provoke the discussion inside the coalition negotiations in Germany. And if you remember, and I know this um, has had an effect, maybe good or bad, we can discuss that with, with Lucas, but if you remember the, the, the important European speech, speeches by Macron in 2017, both the Sorbonne speeches and the Athens speech, um, took place right in the middle of the coalition negotiations in Germany. And this was deliberate. You know, Macron wanted to show his level of, of ambition to Europe and in particular to Germany and impress on the German political system the notion that there was a strong willing, willingness on the French part to move ahead.
Excellent. Thank you very much. Also, sort of for the remark that uh, parts of this debate, even for economists, is slightly arcane. So that that was a relief for political scientists here here in Copenhagen. I can can assure you. And the point about looking out for whether there's a new Sabon speech by Macron would, is, is also interesting. And that the clock is ticking and what the Commission should do, I think we'll get back to all these points. But before that, we go to Brussels. We go to Jakob von Kierkegaard. And all Danes following this webinar, but probably everybody else will have noticed your sort of very vocal sort of participation in the debate on the vaccines. And you always also have strong views about sort of what, what Denmark should do. Although when we contacted you about this webinar and asked you to contribute to the Danish debate on this issue, you just responded, well, which debate? And then we wrote back to you, well, that's where you come into the picture, Jakob. So now we are expecting sort of a usual lively intervention from you. And you are at the Peterson Institute for International Economics and at the GMF. So now over to you, Jakob, the floor is yours. Well, thank you, Lurga. It's a, it's a great pleasure to be here. And I should say that, uh, yes, I'm here to provide a Danish perspective on the debate, uh, but I would also um, I hope so. Um, oh, here we go. Okay, yeah. Um, I am obviously a, a, a Dane looking at the Danish debate from outside, so I will do exactly as Lucas said, which is to provide a slightly normative perspective of what I think, quite frankly, uh, Denmark should be doing in this debate, because Luga already mentioned that the Danish government has essentially shown its colors, so to speak, uh, uh, earlier uh, this week by signing on to the uh, Austrian letter. Um, but I think it's also important to, to understand uh, where Denmark stands coming out of the pandemic, because there's no doubt that a lot of the reframing of the uh, stability and growth pact uh, potential reform will be colored by countries' experiences fiscally and otherwise. Uh, I presented, since I will be talking about what I think Denmark should do, I have a couple of slides and I, I, I warn you that I'm going to subject you to a little bit of national income accounting uh, uh, to, to try to understand what the Danish situation actually is uh, uh, and how that should dictate what the policy response should be. So I'm just going to share my screen here very quickly. I think Jakob is just trying to reconnect. If it doesn't work, then we're just going to change the order and go to Cinebox Conan, but let's see whether he re-emerges uh, from cyberspace all the way from Brussels. Let's see what happens. I think basically what we'll do is that we... Uh, change the order of, of speakers, and then we move uh, directly to Sina, and then I'll be in contact with Jakob and just ask him not to use the slides, because at least I could hear him. He was a bit sort of, <laughs> he was looking very still, so to speak, but I could definitely hear what he was saying. So, so I think that's what we'll try to do. But before that, when I indicated that there's not been a lot of debate about this particular issue in Denmark, uh, I was not 100% correct, because there's been one person who's actually pushed the issue, and that is our next speaker, that is uh, Sine Baks Konen, and you are the Executive Director of European Affairs and Finance Denmark. And uh, what you now present is obviously also you know, the banking sector, the Danish banking sector's perspective. So over to you, Sine. Oops, microphone. The microphone? Yeah, thank oh, you. Thanks. <laughs> yeah, thanks, Luger, and uh, hello, everyone. I will throw in a few, few uh, financial sector perspectives and then draw some broad, broader analysis conclusions as well. Um, right now, we have our uh, gaze fixed on recovery, uh, like everyone else. And what we can see is that the COVID crisis has actually acted like a magnifying glass on the situation we had in economically in Europe before the crisis which means uh, we have a very uneven recovery around Europe. Um, our sector is also playing a, a major role in that recovery. And just to give you a, an example from Denmark, uh, yesterday uh, we came out with an agreement uh, together with the Danish government that our sector will take over the loans uh, issued by the Danish state during the crisis. 
And basically, all companies will now have to get credit valuated, uh, which they haven't been, obviously, and uh, until now by the state. So that's one thing that we are, are looking into and which I think will take place in not in all countries, but in many European countries. So already here, we will have some differences of coming out of uh, the recovery. And we are, of course, always very preoccupied that we see a stable macroeconomic situation around Europe, which I think uh, will take a lot longer time in some countries uh, than others. And I think that's an important point also to remember when heads of state and government are sitting around a table. They come from very different economic backgrounds or with their public um, uh, finance. I also want to throw in uh, the question of climate and sustainable development in Europe. Uh, there is a lot of legislation going on and also a lot of regulation directed to the financial sector who are now, as of this year, uh, obliged to disclose basically not just the CO2 footprint of our investments, but in a very short time frame, also biodiversity, water, air pollution, and so on. And that will, of course, drive an enormous change on business level, which needs to be supported going forward also from a public level. Does that mean that we need a huge fund or reallocation of funds on an EU level, or do we need more taxes? How do we make an incentive structure that underpins all the different obligations that are now being put on business to help with this transformation? I think that's a discussion we haven't finished, and it plays into this discussion uh, as well. So these are sort of two major things um, which will define uh, the discussions also on the fiscal rules. Then, as uh, Shaheen pointed out, I think we really have a question of timing here. Do heads of state and government have other things to do? Afghanistan still tackling COVID. All these things we know uh, on European level, agenda changes fast. And is this really the right time to have uh, this discussion? Is it important enough, um, even if we think it's hugely important in, in this group? I also really do think that the fact that we will have simultaneous discussions on whether to lax on the Stability and Growth Pact regulation and whether to sort of have a permanent reallocation of funds on top of next generation uh, EU, those two things at the same time will hurt not just in Copenhagen, but also in other uh, small and richer countries. And, and that's basically also a point I want to make up in the analysis. What we see with the letter yesterday is eight small countries coming out um, reacting beforehand, before the discussions today and tomorrow in the informal ECOFIN. And I think we are not at all near any uh, clear picture on, on the power relations in, in the EU27 after Brexit. So we have a little bit of Brexit playing in here. Do we see, uh, is, is this an ad hoc group? How, how will this group uh, solidify themselves around this discussion? Uh, I, of course, agree. It'll all depend also on how the elections will uh, fall out in, uh, in, in Germany. But if you ask uh, a prime minister from a small, rich country, could be a northern country, could be Denmark, what are you going to say to your voters? You are at, at the same time saying to your colleagues in Europe, it's OK if we don't hold the screw so tight on the fiscal regulation, and at the same time, we are having a fixed, permanent, fund-backed debt, debt uh, issuance instrument, which will reallocate uh, funds to other EU countries. Um, I, I can't see our prime minister uh, in her time, uh, but I have to say even a really pro-European uh, prime minister, which which is not, uh, would have a hard time explaining that to their voters. And I think that is also something we need to take into, uh, into account. And at the same time, all the heads of st uh, state and government has a really uncomfortable tr truth to tell the voters. 
there's no public cover big enough to cover the costs for the sustainable transition. And even if you deploy all the business in the world, um, this will still also not be enough. So there will be some taxing on on those people you want to vote for you. And that's what we see with the own resources, proposals, and so on. So I think there are many challenges um, at the same time, which will make this a very difficult um, negotiation. And I have to say, I'm not optimist on, on the outcome of a, of a reform of the fiscal rules. I'm much more optimist uh, if you look at the green transition. Um, I think there's a huge willingness on behalf of my sector and on business to move in the right direction. Uh, but overall, I see I, I'm, I'm expecting, you know, heads on uh, discussions uh, going through from this ECOFIN and through many ECOFINs from now on. Um, so on one side, positive uh, Lüge for, for a sustainable transition. And, but I have to say, I'm, I'm very pessimist that we will see any, any changes um, in the near future on, on the fiscal rules, together with the difficult discussion of a permanent uh, sort of fund uh, bond back. So that would be my first input to the discussion. Excellent. Thank you very much also for putting the debate into an even broader sort of perspective with pointing to the important discussion about uh, maybe a permanent uh, fiscal capacity, permanent recovery fund, uh, whatever you like to call it, a Hamiltonian moment, as Olaf mm -hmm. Scholz uh, once, once called it. And now I think I'll try to go back to the comeback kit of this debate. So, Jakob, I think you are back with us, right? I, I am, and I will, uh, no, 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 I will, uh, I will refrain from uh, putting my slideshow on since that apparently is not compatible with Belgian infra uh, internet infrastructure. But basically, basically, as I said, uh, you know, what I will try to just basically say that I think if you look at everything that I certainly read from Denmark coming out of the pandemic, um, people will rightly be feeling quite good. Uh, about how it was handled, uh, but also from a macroeconomic point of view with reference to the uh, deficit and debt rules, Denmark actually adhered to the existing rules even in 2020. Uh, uh, so, so even if I take Shaheen's point that you could in principle put everyone under an excessive deficit procedure, you actually can't because it doesn't look like Denmark will have uh, breached them. So it's difficult for me to see uh, that there will be, as, as was also just articulated, uh, a sort of smugness, a sense of, well, why do we need to change anything? Uh, you just, everybody just have to do what we did and everything will be fine, uh, which, you know, quite frankly, is not uh, uh, very constructive in my opinion, but it does reflect uh, what is normally in economics referred to as a small state mind, namely that you can conduct whatever uh, economic policy you want, uh, it's only going to affect you. Uh, which to some extent is true in a, in a country the size of Denmark, but absolutely is not true uh, for a, an economy the size of the EU uh, or the euro area for that matter, which by the way now today is the world's by a significant margin largest current account surplus area. Uh, what we do actually have a lot of implications uh, going forward. So when you when you take that lens on uh, and then look at what Denmark from its uh, normatively should be doing, uh, you know, I think it's very clear to me, at least, that, that the Danish economy is characterized by one major imbalance, namely that Denmark, similarly to uh, countries like Germany, the Netherlands and a few others, uh, have a chronically and frankly excessive current account surplus. Uh, right now, the, the total sort of net savings in Denmark is running around 13 to 14 percent of GDP. Over half of that uh, is, is basically accounted for by the current account surplus, which basically means that rather than investing at home, the, Danes, uh, the Danish economy is set up in a way that uh, it sends those savings abroad. Uh, uh, and I think that is is uh, that has the implication that Denmark, like Germany, like the Netherlands, have been accumulating, uh, you know, foreign assets uh, very very rapidly. So that now we're we're somewhere around 80% of GDP. Uh, that is usually a source of 
uh, pride almost uh, in, in a lot of the Danish debates. And it obviously, uh, you know, signals to some degree uh, export competitiveness, et cetera, et cetera. But it's also when you get to that level uh, with no end in sight, frankly, uh, it's also, in my opinion, an acute source of political vulnerability and risk. Especially because if you look a little closer in, in the Danish case, uh, this is not uh, foreign direct investment assets. It's increasingly portfolio assets uh, that are acquired by the pension uh, system, by the pension sector, because Denmark happens to have the largest per capita uh, or, or GDP, uh, the largest private pension savings in the world, mentioned about 250% of GDP. Uh, so they are well you know, Danish national savings are well intermediated uh, by the private pension sector, but they are, in my opinion, at a, of a magnitude that they are an increasing source of risk. Um, and it's it's also somewhat ironic, uh, in my opinion, when you're looking at a country like Denmark, which is by any uh, metric, in my opinion, an excess saving nations, as reflected by the chronic current account surplus. Meanwhile, it has uh, you know, the sort of infamous R minus G equation uh, is, you know, negative to the tune of five to six percent, uh, which certainly means that, in my opinion, you know, when it comes to uh, the, the, the government sector, not investing more, uh, either at home, but also uh, uh, through the EU is, a, is, in my opinion, from a macroeconomic point, quite frankly, a no brainer and would actually in the long run be a, um, you know, a good for the long run uh, uh, resilience and sustainability of, uh, of also the Danish economy. So what, what, what do we need to do? Well, there are those who argue that, well, we don't need to worry about the savings surplus because uh, aging population is going to eventually take care of it. You know, the savings rate is going to come down uh, uh, as a result. Um, I happen to not believe that is true because the problem is that uh, this aging population, yes, is likely to reduce savings, but it's going to reduce investments even more. Uh, and what that means is that S minus uh, uh, I uh, is actually going to increase. Uh, uh, and, and that's a very bad situation. Also, by the way, means that interest rates uh, is going to remain very, very low in a, in a country like Denmark for a very, very long time, which is, by the way, true for the euro area as a whole. You can also just keep, as I said, keep accumulating net foreign assets. Sure, we have a pension system that's quite good at it. But again, when you're doing it at the tune of six, seven, eight percent a year, uh, you're going to be uh, ending up buying increasingly number of very volatile portfolio assets, and that's a major source of risk. Ask any German taxpayer that had to bail out, you know, uh, Landesbanken, etc., over the years. Um, and so, so you, I think you need to do something to increase the level of investment. The good news from a country like Denmark is that it's actually arguably the country, uh, maybe in the world, that has the best uh, historical experiences with what I would call demand-driven industrial policy. Uh, because it was, as uh, soon mentioned, uh, the green transition. Well, there's probably no country in the world that has a better uh, a history of, of generating uh, a green you know, uh, a sector uh, by policy intervention. I mean, it's not a coincidence that over 90% of all offshore windmills uh, currently running in Europe, it's about 6,000 of them, over 90% of them are uh, built and installed by Danish companies. If you consider Siemens, which is, you know, Siemens Wind is located in Denmark. Uh, this is basically a function of uh, uh, industrial policy, but through demand creation, not the kind of industrial policy that French policymakers, including, by the way, Shaheen's old boss, uh, uh, Mr. Montbourg, once uh, uh, talked about. Uh, so Denmark actually has very good experience uh, with doing this. Um, so I think that that it, when you think through the kind of plausible 
uh, changes to the stability and growth pact that make sense from Denmark's own macroeconomic point of view. It absolutely goes in the direction of turning the stability and growth pact into variations of a golden rule, so to speak, by exempting large amount of green investments, because that would be very directly uh, in, in Denmark's own economic interest. It wouldn't necessarily lo uh, change the uh, uh, excess savings problem that Denmark has, because that's really a matter of increasing domestic uh, investment, but it would certainly help uh, the rest of Europe, which I think overall would be would be good for 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 uh, for Denmark, but also for for Danish export, and overall improving the uh, increasing the level of investment throughout the EU economy, taking us to the direction of well, maybe we should make the uh, recovery fund into a permanent sort of supplementary investment budget with appropriate conditionality, et cetera, et cetera. But those really are the ways in which the reform of the stability and growth pact should be thought. Uh, about in in uh, from Denmark from a Danish macroeconomic point of view, and and I'm not personally convinced that this current government, uh, current prime minister, has any desire, intelligence, or interest in doing so. But we can only hope. Let me stop there. Well, at least you made your case very in a very sort of clear way. So 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 I think that that was very sort of persuasive. You seem from my from my angle that that way of arguing. But let's uh, now sort of open the discussion. As I indicated, you can uh, use obviously the, uh, the the chat. I'd like to start by going back to to you, Lucas. Um, we touched upon the German debate, uh, and uh, as also Shine mentioned, I mean there was maybe the hope that something could still happen in the German debate. Do you see that taking place? And particularly, I mean, do you see also maybe some parties coming out in the end game of the election? Maybe the FDP which would then narrow so the possibilities of Germany to write that rather loose formulated coalition statement with regards to uh, what the topic that we're discussing here that Shahin asked for. Over to you. Um, yeah, yeah, I would have a slightly different reading of what Shahin said. Um, because I think that like, domestic fiscal policy has been quite important in the debate, namely that for a lot of a lot of parties are constantly confronted with um, the argument that you want to keep the deck, debt break, you want to uh, lower taxes or increase investment, um, and the, these things just don't add up. And I think that that has been a fairly constant feature. So, and I would even say, um, also the Greens have been fa fairly up upfront about the fact that they want to like increase investment and change the debt break. So, I think that that was in the debate. I think. Um, and and I would expect also that to be again there in the in the debate, like in the debate between the candidates on on, on the weekend. Uh, as I said yesterday, what entered the picture a bit was like the European um, attacks or like the attacks on European policy from the CDU against Charles, which has turned a bit like the debate poisonous. Um, which in my view also shows that it's like really hard to debate these issues in an election campaign because the temptation um, is so big to just use it as a political football and play on the fact that voters don't understand it well. Um, and so I'm not even sure that I would want to have a bigger debate on this at the moment um, because it polarizes an issue that doesn't need to be polarized at, at this stage, I would say. And so I agree with Shaheen that I think we will most likely will see like a coalition agreement where we won't have a sentence which says we will get rid of the debt break. Um, also because that requires a constitutional majority so that no coalition will likely have. But um, I think we will just need to have, have look at what this coalition plans in terms of expenditure, and then you get a pretty good indication of what that means for like their macro policies going forward. And I would expect that there will be something on on, on the fiscal rules, like even if it's a sentence or so, um, that gives you an indication where the that government um, is headed. Excellent. Shahin, do you want to comment on that? And, and secondly, I mean, uh, see this point about we should look upon even a broader picture also with the, uh, well, maybe uh, a permanent recovery fund or some kind of fiscal capacity. Could you explain how these two 
debates are interlinked. That will be, I think, very helpful for the Danish audience because, as you know, there was a lot of debate on the recovery fund in Denmark with us siding with the Frugal Four, and that debate will probably pick up again uh, very quickly. Over to you. Muting has worked. Yeah, now you are back. Shane. Okay. Uh, okay, so no, ju uh, just uh, re reacting quickly to to Lucas's point on on fiscal policy. So you know, I agree. I think fiscal policy has been discussed during this election, but I don't think has been discussed quite to the extent that I would have hoped for. Uh, were, were the the rules uh, uh, surrounding fiscal policy, and so it's true that you know there is a, a sort of an incompatibility between different platforms and the current set of rules, but. I haven't seen very many parties other than the Greens taking this to the logical conclusions that as a result, the rules need to be uh, reformed, and, and, reformed and, and discussed. And a point about the constitutional majority, uh, you know, I, I think we tend to forget that um, we can change the rules even if the government doesn't have a two-third majority. And the very uh, best proof of that is that actually there was a constitutional change in September 2020 to allow greater transfers inside Germany. And so, you know, I, I think there is a, a tendency in the German debate to set the bar for constitutional change as something that is entirely unattainable when the history of the last 50 years is that Germany does constitutional amendments every five to 10 years, you know, and they happen very regularly and they're not as controversial as they are uh, portrayed to be, I think, uh, in the general uh, uh, public. So, I, you know, I, I, I think that's something that's useful to keep in mind. The same goes for the European Treaty, by the way. We keep saying, oh, it's impossible to do X, Y, Z because, you know, it would require a reform of the treaty. Yes, reality is what, you know, we did reform the treaty to create the ESM. We tend to forget it, but we did. So you know, I, I just be wary about these these arguments. Uh, I, I think you know they're not um, untrue, but I think they tend to raise the bar too too high for 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 action. And on, on the interaction between um, between uh, fiscal policy uh, between the sort of you know fiscal rules and uh, and the RRF. So the, the two are, 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 are linked intellectually, even though they're, they're not linked uh, in, in the policy process. Uh, my personal view uh, is that it's very unlikely that the RRF itself will be turned into a permanent device. And maybe it doesn't need to be. What I strongly believe, however, is that the technology that was used and that, underp and that underpins the RRF, namely, you know, common issuance backed by future own resources, that technology, which has been sort of tested with the RRF, uh, can and probably will be used in the future. Um, and, you know, I think for political expediency, it will never be called the RRF. It might actually need um, a, a treaty reform because, to be fair, the, the, the legal basis on which the RRF is built uh, limits the ability to use it on a permanent basis. Uh, but I think that's a possibility, but it's, a, in my view, it's a long-term possibility. And I think the the, the short-term debate or the shorter-term debate will be first on, on the fiscal rules, and it's probably not useful to link uh, the two. Uh, however, I'm pretty sure that uh, in the minds of very many people, uh, they're only prepared to do so many concessions on national fiscal policy uh, uh, if they are uh, certain that, uh, you know, the transfer or the mutualization at the European level is limited and vice versa. I think the more they do uh, uh, in terms of uh, fiscal risk sharing at the European level, uh, the more they will require tighter rules at the national level. And this is why, even though the two are not linked in terms of policy process, uh, I think intellectually and politically, uh, for very many people around the table, they will be. Yeah, so so there is a trade-off here. What do you say, Jakob, uh, about that? And particularly, also, do you have any comment on the proposals by the European Fiscal Board with regards to this issue? That obviously also goes for Lucas, if you want to comment on that. Mm -hmm. 
microphone. This whole muting thing uh, after a year and a half and it's still not working. But anyway, no, but I, I think it's important to, to also think through the timing of this debate uh, into the more generalized macroeconomic picture for the euro area and the EU as a whole. Uh, we, we just yesterday had the ECB uh, come out and present what is arguably certainly the by far the best macroeconomic outlook that I can remember. Five percent. I, I know we're coming out of a, of a et cetera, et cetera. But five percent growth in 2021, four point six percent growth in 2022, uh, uh, and even two percent, which is well above the potential growth rate in in 2023. Uh, this is a very very good outlook. Uh, so yet yet. Uh, the ECB is still presenting uh, a uh, inflation outlook for 2023 of only one and a half percent, which is well below its new symmetric two percent target. Uh, and, and you have to ask yourself, with which even in sh with such great economic growth uh, uh, in the medium term, we still can't get back to two percent. Um, you know, two percent inflation uh, that leaves the central bank in a, in a bind. Uh, and uh, it, it, to think that, uh, you know, discussions about the stability and growth pact and certainly the type of discussions that similar to the frugal letter of, of, of this week suggests that, oh, we should just, uh, you know, get back to the existing rules and basically, uh, therefore, but from the central EU uh, point of view, basically go back to uh, what in many cases will be dramatic fiscal austerity. Uh, because if you think about what the 120 rule and things like that would do to national fiscal policies, you're basically going to legislate, uh, or, or in this case, not even that, regulate uh, a recession, in my opinion. More to the point, uh, you're going to basically turn, if you want to turn the euro area into Japan, hey, uh, put the Stability and Growth Pact uh, unreformed into practice again, because you're going to force the ECB in that uh, scenario to not only, uh, you know, we, we, can, we can start discussing what the size of the uh, regular uh, asset purchase program will be, uh, but it's going to be uh, very significant. And then the ECB is going to have to debate uh, if it's going to break its own uh, rules for uh, asset purchases in that program, which, of course, the PEP is is uh, is a different one. But but, you know, I, I think it's just recent. It's really important to embed this reform discussion about the sort of general, actually very positive macroeconomic scenario that the euro area and the EU is in. Do you really want to break that? by uh, uh, doing what some people, including Denmark and others, are arguing, I think it would be uh, politically destabilizing for the European project uh, to, to a degree that few people uh, actually contemplate right now. Do you agree on that, Lucas? I mean, that, that could have that major repercussion? If, if yeah, I think, I, think that, I think that's a very good point, but I think there's, like what Jakob points to is like a fundamental intellectual dishonesty of this group, I would say, because I don't think they want that. I don't think they want to plunge like Europe back into austerity. I think what they do want, or like maybe they are hardliners who do, but my reading from like um, capitals in the Hague or so is not that they think we should like put the austerity brakes on, on the whole of Europe, but it's like the unwillingness to put political capital into explaining, and as, as Sinn said before, in, to explaining to their own electorates that the reality has changed. And of course, it's easier to put it on the European Commission to then find like murky solutions and then also blame them for it afterwards than to go to the table and live up to your responsibility and say, hey, we have a rule, a, a rule book that doesn't work anymore. Um, and so I'm, I'm, I agree with Jakob, like if we were to apply the rules by the book, it would be devastating. But I don't think anybody wants that, um, and so so and that makes it so frustrating to have, see like the debate now shaping up, because it means basically we will have to fight like these straw men, um, which basically like where the argument will always be we need better enforcement, we need like um, uh, less complex rules, which in the end I'm not sure. Is geared towards having any kind of reform. Just one one comment on what Shaheen said before, um, just to clarify what, what, what I meant on the, um, you need a two-thirds majority to change the constitution in Germany. 
like in any in all cases. This is easier to get for like technical adjustments, when, especially when it comes to the federal uh, level and the states. Um, but in the case of the debt break, or if, for every any change of the constitution, it will mean in the, in the next five years most likely you will need the CDU, because CDU and AfD will together have a third of the of the seats in the Bundestag. And they have been very clear and very vocal and on record that they don't want to change the debt bag in the constitution. And this is why I think it's just not in the cards, no matter what the coalition is. That's all I wanted to say. It's always good to remember the rules of the German constitution. Thank you very much. I was just wondering, it seems to me from listening to this debate that we have all these already solutions flying around, some of them also pretty arcane about sort of uh, changing the rules, also the proposal uh, from uh, from the institutions uh, committee and so forth. But there's still no agreement what the actual problem is. What is the problem that we need to fix? I mean, how on earth do we then actually end up this agreeing upon that instead of then losing ourselves in all these uh, details about what change the rules? Any ideas on that? And particularly when you have a German and a French election about to take place, can the commission play some kind of a role there? Or how do we actually see that uh, debate uh, playing out? Sini, would you... Uh, Try to answer that very precise question. Such an easy question, so thank you for that. <laughs> but I think the Commission is is already trying to play a role by saying, okay, the money that we are deploying out of the next generation EU fund has to go to certain objectives, be it uh, the green agenda or the digital um, transformation that we need. So the 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 very famous two twin twin transformations that are going on. And, and the question is really, um, and, and I think that has been, it's a very old uh, problem in, in the EU. So you have rich countries who are already on the right path, who are doing all the things uh, correctly. And we have poorer countries who really need to do a transformation. Um, and, and, and do we have what the Italians would call solidarity enough to help our neighbors go through that transformation. That is basically a sort of political hardcore question, which was difficult for the rich Nordic countries to avoid in a COVID crisis. But but can they? Have, but will they avoid it this time? I agree with, with Jakob when he said, if you can deploy more means which are fixed to these sort of positive future-oriented transformations of society, it would be a lot easier to get those heads of state and government around the table than to just, you know, open, even if it's true that uh, what more have said here also, that a very strict application of the Stability and Growth Pact would lead to, at least if not a recession, then a very hard strain on the forecasted growth. I think um, there is a willingness if people are sure that the money are being invested in the right thing um, to, to be solidaric. But, but, uh, but this is really a matter of political trust. Um, I, it, it's, it's not going to answer your question, but, but you see that the willingness to, go, to, to say yes you know, increases if we know where the money uh, you know, is going. That's basically it. Jakob, over to you. Uh, yeah, no, I mean, I, I, I think that, you know, what, what is the problem we're trying to solve? In the eyes of some people, of course, it is that, well, there are some countries who are not adhering to the rule book. And then the, in the eyes of other countries, as Shaheen also mentioned, some will say, well, actually, the rule book uh, is the problem. Uh, and, and I happen to be in the category of the latter, uh, that if you look at the, you know, we all basically know where the uh, reference values came from. Uh, it's basically a snapshot of the economic situation in the in the late 1980s and early 1990s, where 5% nominal growth, which, by the way, the ECB is projecting this year, uh, is not uh, was not unreasonable. It's actually the average of what countries had. Uh, if you then have 2% uh, uh, inflation on top of that, uh, well, then you have 3% real growth. And then if you have uh, no deficit longer than th stronger than 3%, that gives you uh, basically debt stability, debt sustainability or stability at roughly the existing level of debt, which for the large EU countries at the time, minus uh, Belgium and Italy, was about 60%. Uh, so there's nothing, you know, these reference values were a snapshot from the past. 
uh, but they're not, uh, uh, and that is a problem today. Uh, especially if you, uh, you know, uh, belong to the category that I'm in, which uh, believes that, as I said earlier, uh, population aging actually reduces uh, the natural rate of interest because investments drops more than savings. Uh, uh, but that also, and, and therefore, uh, you know, you're going to have very, very low costs of uh, debt going forward, which means that, again, the 60% reference value from the late 1980s is meaningless when the actual debt burden uh, is, is estimated. Uh, uh, and therefore, the way out of this, in my opinion, which ironically has also been what the, EC, uh, what the Euro group always argued to the IMF during the Greek crisis, was that, you know, you need to look at the actual fiscal burden of the debt. That's what matters, not, not uh, the actual level of the debt. But those are the kinds of things that uh, types of solution you probably want to need to get into. But it doesn't change the fact that, you know, we're stuck with the reference values that we have within the treaty framework. Uh, uh, so the question is, and, and, you know, you need to be a better lawyer than me, uh, since I'm not one, uh, to figure the way out of that. Thanks. And I'll just say we'll put Jakob's slides uh, on, on our web page uh, afterwards. Uh, but Shine, what's your take here? I mean, what is the biggest problem that the EU has to solve uh, with uh, this overall discussion about the pact? And which problem do you think that governments can then actually agree upon at the end of the day? Microphone, sorry. <laughs> okay, so um, no, that's a very good question. Uh, my view is that uh, the rules have proven to be deficient, deficient in at least uh, uh, three areas. Uh, one is that they have not uh, enabled enough macroeconomic stabilization in downturns. And so I think that has been the weakness, even though they have been designed and improved over time, specifically to be formulated in structural adjustment uh, a path and to use uh, output gaps so, such that they, uh, in principle, uh, allow all the flexibility in downturns, I think the experience is that this has not been the case. I think the second weakness is that they have become overly complex and they are uh, based on a number of unobservable variables that make them very difficult to uh, to understand and in fact to implement. Um, you know, measures such as the output gaps that are uh, overly technical uh, and in fact subject to very profound revisions are an inerrant source of, uh, of, uh, of unpredictability, unpredictability in the rules. And I think the last point is that they have tended to create a bias against public investment, and they explain to a large extent across Europe, uh, including in the countries that have performed very well fiscally, why there has been a relative lack of public investment. And so I think that leads to a fourth uh, problem which is that lack of public investment has undermined as and is undermining the ability of European countries to deploy the investments that are needed for the energy and, 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 and climate transition. So these, in my view, are all the problems that should be solved. And I don't think they are the problems that will be solved uh, with the current reforms uh, of the rules that are being discussed. And so I tend to think, uh, and, and I know that sounds very defeatist, and I would love to hear Jacob and, and Lucas on this, uh, but I tend to think that the macroeconomic battle between the frugals and the rest is not going to be settled. Uh, I don't think we will, uh, I, I don't think there will be a winner or loser in that macroeconomic battle, and we will stay uh, in a fairly uh, ambiguously constructive uh, uh, arrangement uh, around, around this. Where I think there is more space for consensus uh, is on um, you know, opening some flexibility in the rules such that public investment, and in particular public investments towards green and energy transition, is not curtailed. And so if there is one uh, avenue for reform of the rules that I find more plausible, uh, it's that one, where I think even the frugals could agree that a special exemption for investments related to our commitment to emissions reductions uh, are, are, are created. So that to me is, it's a bit of a defeatist line, 
Uh, and it's a bit sad as an economist to concede that uh, the economic discussion will not take place. Um, but, but, but politically, I think it's the one that's the most viable. Very clear statement. What do you say? Let's start with Lucas, uh, and particularly also the point about climate change. Well, that could be somehow part of things that, that uh, member states could agree upon. Then we move to, to Jakob. And then I have a final question also about the State of the Union address. Lucas. Yeah, I think climate change is interesting because it, it bridges in a way rifts that are like the, the, the typical north, south, whatever you want to call it, uh, rift. Um, but the question is how far that, that takes us. Um, one interesting aspect of the climate um, debate when we come to the fiscal uh, question is that, of course, the spending we will have to do on climate change is not only investment. But like they have, we have a whole debate now on like social expenditure and like a, so, the, the a socially palatable green transition and the expenditure we will have to do there will by no means only be investment, but it will also be transfers and it will be investment in education, which under like our current rules do not qualify as investment. So I think we get into a whole new like also economic debate on what we should count as as investment if we go down that road. But I would agree that this is like the most promising uh, place to start if we want to to open the door for uh, for for new investment. And I think this is also where the debate uh, will be headed. But then the question is still: is that something that goes as far as like countries saying, okay, we we open an exemption door for that? And there I'm 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 torn. Jakob, could that be a part of the solution? Whenever we say something is green, well, then there could be hope even to have the frugal force uh, on board. Do you see that happening? Yeah, I, th I think that will happen. I mean, I think even in the case of Denmark, uh, maybe maybe not the governing party, but certainly some of its supportive uh, parties in parliament uh, uh, might be quite persuaded by that line of argument. Uh, but but I think actually that, that we need to also uh, think through what the implications are for the commitments that we have made to ourselves and to the world uh, on, on climate change, because we are now committed by law to a 55 percent reduction uh, in, in just nine years or by 2030. Uh, to me, that means that the only meaningful metric uh, that determines whether something is green investment or not. Uh, a 55% is basically a, a, a sort of, if you like, uh, emissions productivity measure. And what I mean by that is that uh, we need basically, unless we want to destroy growth, uh, we need to uh, double the uh, amount of output per uh, uh, unit of emission. Oh, sorry, the other way around. We need to... Uh, uh, cut the level of emission per unit of output by half. Uh, uh, so, so basically, that, that's a very, very uh, uh, steep, uh, uh, you know, if you wanted to have emissions productivity or whatever you want to call it, such a measure. But if you want to actually do that, uh, you got you to think about, okay, what, what type of investments qualifies to actually lower the level of emissions by uh, uh, per unit of output? Uh, that's the kind of metric that I think we, we need to think through, and there's certainly nowhere to be found within the existing framework. But if we want to integrate, and I think that is true because I agree with what, uh, what Sina also said earlier, that this is the way to sell higher levels of public investment. we got to come up with uh, uh, measures uh, that uh, don't exist in the existing framework uh, uh, for fiscal spending and public ex expenditure uh, to, in order to do that, to come up with a quote unquote, I'm not saying it's easy to measure, but an objective manner in which you could quantify what type of investments actually will lower uh, emissions intensity per unit of output. So Sina, that was your cue, I mean, basically. Uh, and could you also, I mean, just say a few words, do you think this could fly in a Danish uh, debate? Uh, Jakob seemed a bit skeptical about the, the government party with regards to using arguments like this of linking sort of reform of the stability and growth pact to climate change. I, well, I think it has a, a lot better chance to fly than just saying we want to loosen uh, the, the stability and growth pact. And just to come back to one thing that, that Jakob said, 
we are actually having a measure system for private investments now. Uh, this, the famous taxonomy, if you haven't heard about it, it's because you're not in my sector where we only speak about taxonomy. And taxonomy is basically sector per sector measurement uh, of our investments right now only on CO2 levels, but it will also be on water, biodiversity and the other things I mentioned before. And I think it would be pretty good if you could have a public measurement or, or the public sector investments going along the same lines, because otherwise, you know, how are we going to um, to equalize with the private? We have to disclose our investments based on the taxonomy. Um, we will have a green bond standard. We'll have all kinds of things in the toolbox in the financial sector, which I don't see how you could not apply on a public uh, sector as well, because we cannot have public spending going in one direction and then having the business to do the whole transformation based on, um, on, on regulation. So I think here is a conversation that we have not finished. Can we bring the Danish government to the table with targeted investments uh, across Europe on, on, on green and sustainable investments? Yes, I, I do think we can. Basically also because of the logic that Jakob has himself uh, implied this would be really good for Danish business because somebody would have to have to go somewhere and and uh, and buy the solutions and and just just to be quite clear how do we know that that would be true when we were discussing the next next generation eu fund where denmark did not get a lot of money because the real preoccupation was that those countries who got the money should invest that money in the green sector. That was the preoccupation of our of our government, not the the 11 billion that we got, which is is really small. So they were only preoccupied with the fact that their colleagues around Europe should be obliged to use that money, especially on green purposes, which would then feed a demand back to those countries who have industries who can deliver on that. So I do think there's a uh, I'm more positive about that than just you know adjusting the rules. Excellent. And now let's have the uh, final round of this uh, webinar. As you all know, on Wednesday, Commission President Ursula von der Leyen will give her State of the Union address. I'm sure that they are now all working on that uh, on the 13th floor of the Bellamont building. Now, our speakers, you have the great opportunity of sort of being the advisor of the Commission President for four, three minutes, three, four minutes each. What would you actually advise the Commission President to say about this particular issue that we have discussed, and obviously it is a rather broad issue, so you could obviously also highlight issues that are connected to the recovery fund or the economic growth that, that, that Jakob mentioned, but what would you actually advise her to say or to prepare the debate now that we also discussed the fact that, well, we have a German election campaign, we have also a French one, and then maybe we'll not have many initiatives coming out of, of France and Germany. So there is a role for the commission. So, I mean, what would be your advice uh, to the to the commission president? And since I know that Shaheen has worked as an advisor to for Emmanuel Macron, I will uh, take the uh, sort of opportunity and <laughs> just by by saying, let's go to Paris as, as the first speaker. I hope you sort of will participate in this sort of different way of, uh, of uh, ending a debate. Uh, yes, I, actually, Jakob said earlier that I had worked for Montbourg. I've made many mistakes in my life, but but not this one. Uh, um, I'm glad I had that I was right then. <laughs> and, uh, so, no, I, I think the commission, uh, either the president of the commission uh, or, or the acting commissioner could actually play a much more active role in this discussion than, than they have. And it's a bit sad. I mean, there are two ways to read the, the last Gentiloni uh, interview. One is... Uh, you know, kind of admi admitting defeat and basically saying, I'm not going to propose anything until there is a consensus. And if that's the case, then you wonder what is the role of the commission? Because, you know, presumably when there is a consensus, then the commission is not really necessary anymore. Uh, uh, so that's the, 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 the bad reading of this interview. The more positive reading of it is to consider that is actually a, a, a veiled threat and basically saying, well, you know, if you're not doing anything, if member states are not prepared, to have uh, an open discussion about this. The Commission will be forced to implement the rules, including potentially implement them in a very stupid fashion, and then let member states bear with the consequences. Either uh, an abrupt uh, 
uh, fiscal tightening, as Jakob uh, warned, was a possibility, or uh, uh, a widespread suspension of the rules hidden in, in a generalized uh, application of the ex excessive deficit procedure, for example. So there are various possible threats possible by the Commission. I, I think there was an interesting process that had started and that has been killed which was a, re a review of the European economic governance. I mean, sadly, because of timing, this started just before the COVID crisis and therefore was suspended because of COVID and then, you know, supposedly reinstated. The reality is that there hasn't been very much of a conversation around this. And, and maybe what the president of the commission, if not the ex-in commissioner, uh, maybe what could take place uh, after the German elections and possibly either during the French election campaign or, or after, is you know a restart of that uh, of that conversation, with the hope of basically reviving a, a roadmap I, I have uh, worked on uh, back in 2012, almost uh, 10 years ago, and which has been kind of buried since then, uh, and which I think you know uh, you know deserves to be uh, to be unearthed, not only on, in the fiscal area, by the way, because I think we are stuck. Uh, equally on areas like the banking union, which has been mentioned before. I mean, you know, we have a very uh, deficient and ineffective resolution framework. We continue to be stuck, be stuck in the negotiations between uh, a deposit guarantee scheme and sovereign risk weights. I think all of these uh, areas of improvements of the architecture of the euro area uh, are probably as paralyzed as the discussion on fiscal rules. And, and could uh, use uh, some 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 you know uh, re, re, rekindle debate. So I think that's the role of uh, of the Commission, uh, and, and I hope that you know once the the heavy political moments of in in France and Germany are past, there will be a bit more energy towards that. But that doesn't seem to be the case for the time being. In fact, the President of the Commission had the opportunity to really kickstart these debates when she uh, was installed in office in 2019, and she decided not to. So hopefully, she has changed her mind. Okay, that was your take on that. What would you say, Jakob? What would your sort of statement be if you were asked to advise her what she should say in her State of the Union? Well, I, I, I guess I would start from the uh, premise that uh, she's about to become potentially quite a lonely commission president because she's uh, about to lose her, you know, uh, I hate to use the sexist word muti, but but uh, if if Merkel is out and is replaced by a social democratic chancellor in Berlin, uh, being an EPP uh, protege of of Merkel installed in the Balmain is a pretty lonely place to be, in my opinion. Uh, so I would, uh, therefore, in her point of, in her shoes, advise her she needs some new allies, basically. Uh, in my opinion, and and I I think that that I would uh, take also from what Gentiloni Shaheen already mentioned it, uh, but I would actually uh, take a different step from that. I would basically say that look, yes, uh, we at the Commission are going to await um, a, a consensus among the member states on the Stability and Growth Pact rules, but until until there are no, is such a consensus, we're just going to keep them suspended. Uh, uh, because that is going to put the pressure on countries like the Frugals to actually, uh, uh, you know, be of a consensus seeking mind. Whereas if the opposite is the case, we're going to just reinstate them, uh, then it's the opposite. So I would put a full, I would just leave them suspended, which, by the way, I also happen to believe uh, is the likely outcome, at least in 2023. But as a political statement to the Frugals uh, by, by a lonely uh, EPP president at the Balmain, I think that's what she should do. Secondly, I would, uh, from her point of view, say uh, that, look, focus on what they're now finally many, many years overdue. They're protecting EU money uh, going to uh, countries with questionable rule of law. Hungary, Poland, etc. There's no uh, recovery fund money. I would play that up very hard, saying that you know we at the Commission we are focusing on on implementing protecting taxpayers' money. Uh, we want enforceable rules. Uh, that's what we're doing with this, uh, uh, and that's the kind of enforceable rules we also want uh, at the Stability and Growth Pact. And that is why uh, we're not going to reinstate the Stability and Growth Pact until you, member states. Uh, come up with a consensus for it. 
Excellent. Sine, over to you, your spiel. What would you say? Well, first, I would pat her a little bit on the back and commend the commission for actually having put forward, I can't remember when a commission has put forward this amount of regulation all over the place. So, you know, action plans and strategies and roadmaps and what have you, it's all over and it's all over every sector. Um, so there is a direction. She has a direction for the green transformation, for the digital. What will be difficult now, of course, is she has, they put, put forward all the Green Deal proposals this summer. Now we need to have the political debates on that. That will be difficult. She needs to put forward in with all with a lot of people discussing climate, you need to also put forward a credible plan for why growth or we are chasing growth in Europe, why that is not, you know, actually uh, the opposite of a, a, a transformed, green, sustainable society. So she would need to have some thinking on that. Then I would advise her that all the discussions on the strategic autonomy, it's fine, it's good, it's necessary, the world is changing. But I would love her for her to come back with a few good trade deals uh, to Europe to basically also give a signal that, you know, they're not just enemies and crazy American presidents around us. They are basically also a world order that is still functioning. So that would be my um, sort of input. But give give the lady some credit for all the work done already. I'm sure she'd like to hear that. Lucas, what would be your what would be your major advice to her, and particularly also now looking upon the, the present German situation and the fact that well, she may, to use Jakob's uh, expression, soon be home alone in the Belmont. Yeah, I think I can be quick. I think on our topic, like the best is not to touch it at the moment. I think it's not the right time. I think we are 10, 10 days out of an election campaign. I would be very understanding if there was nothing in this speech on on this topic. And I think that would be actually okay. Excellent. And with that remark, you proved that this was an early, early bird uh, seminar. That was also our sort of ambition to have a debate about this at a very early stage uh, in the process, particularly seen from a Danish uh, perspective. So thank you very much uh, to our speakers. Really grateful that you took the time. Thank you very much also to the uh, participants. Uh, who listened uh, sort of very actively, I'm, I'm sure. Uh, what we'll do the next couple of weeks is always to focus upon the State of the Union address and the German election, and they are remembering particularly also Lucas's point of looking more in detail into what do the parties actually say about German economic policy. That's going to be very important there. But uh, please be back uh, on, the, on October the 4th, where we continue with another very exciting and also complicated issue. That's the CBAM. So basically the all board question about what do we do with regards to a carbon adjustment mechanism. So here we are back to the overall topic of climate change. Thank you very much uh, for the Danes on the line. Enjoy what I think will be the last summer day in, in Denmark. And I hope the sun is also shining wherever you basically have been watching this seminar. Thank you very much. We'll put it on our website and we'll also put on Jacob's uh, slides and various sort of articles that we found uh, by our speakers. Thank you very much. Have a great weekend. Thank you, Jacob. You too. Bye-bye. Bye-bye.